Welcome to another edition of The Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. And currently, as you all know, I'm teaching entrepreneurship at Vinh University in Hanoi, Vietnam. Today's guest is Jeremy uh, Kubrick. I hope I pronounced that name correctly. Kubitschek. 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 Author of Communication Code, Unlock Every Relationship, One Conversation at a Time. I love this book. I think this book should be uh, every uh, young person in particular, 18 and over, should be reading this book. But anybody of any age should be reading this book. Uh, so, Jeremy, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you. Well, it's great to have you here. So let's start off with you giving us uh, your background, your professional background, and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, so I'm an entrepreneur. I, uh, I'm from Oklahoma originally. Uh, when I graduated college, I had this professor who kind of gave me this idea of, you know, how you can use business as a platform for good. How do you actually do that? So we, we started a business in Moscow in the early 90s. We started an economic school, which is now the largest private school in Russia. Interesting with the times that we're in. Uh, we started a marketing company and accounting training business. And then I uh, moved back to the, the States and uh, got into um, various distribution businesses and private equity and then started building businesses. I started my first company uh, or started Giant, our first Giant business as a growth consultant consulting business. And then we've scaled it. Uh, we bought John Maxwell's assets over time. We built these big brands like LeaderCast, Catalyst, started partnering with all these thought, thought leaders, sold all of that and started all over in 2013 because we realized that the world was changing so radically from 20th century learning to 21st century learning. And we realized that adults were cynical know-it-alls that didn't read anymore. And so we were like, how do you train? And that's, that's a gross generalization. I know a lot of you are readers, but most people aren't and the trends are going down. So we started to figure out how do you actually uh, build uh, content and adult learning? So we started using visual tools, short, sweet, compact, powerful, punchy, things that are scalable, simple enough to learn and are sustainable. And so I moved to London started building all of this and it started to work. And we've started to scale giant into about 115 countries. So we built the five voices, the five gears, the 100X leader, all of this content, and we've started licensing it. And so we're working with Google and Microsoft and uh, Pfizer and Biogen and blah, blah, blah. And um, that's what we've done. So my business is basically um, uh, taking complex things, making them simple around relational intelligence people dynamics and helping people solve the people problem. I'm curious, what years were you in Russia and what was that like uh, to 90, do business in Russia? It was 93 to 95. My first book was called Leadership is Dead, uh, Making Your Leadership Come Alive. That's the book. And it became a bestseller because I was there during mafia, uh, had a client assassinated. Uh, we were in a coup attempt. Uh, 100 plus people were killed in a one day riots. And so it was chaos. And so I, I write all about my mafia stories and client assassination and all of that during that time. So it was uh, car bombs and um, everything. It was like Chicago in the 30s. Wow. Wow. That was an exper experience. But you were a very young guy. At 21 to 24. Yeah. 24. Yeah. And so you're not even thinking about how dangerous this is, but I'm sure your parents are really thinking about it. No, it was James Bond, uh, John Wayne. That was like um, uh, days, honestly. Well, it sounds like a very interesting uh, time. Uh, so uh, let's talk about uh, your book. Why did you write this book? Yeah, so we, we uh, the communication code, we were, we've been using this book for years. My business partner and I had, uh, we were having frustrations with one another and we had to figure out how do we actually communicate more effectively? And so we realized that's a norm in a lot of businesses, partnerships, marriage. So we created a simple way to explain and almost creating a cipher, a code that if I gave you a code, it will share what expectations I have in my communication. And we realized that the key to, to communication is expectation. 
Uh, communication is, is a transmission. And when I transmit something, you have to receive it and transmit it back that you've received it. So if I can give you a code word and help you figure out what, I, what it is I'm trying to accomplish, then you're going to have a better chance of meeting my expectations and vice versa. And if we can simply share the code word, most people don't know the code words, so they pass each other in the night. So that's why it was written to help people communicate more effectively. Uh, from going through that process of writing the book, did that even improve that skill set even more? You know, just like when you're coaching somebody on how to hit a tennis ball, you find that all of a sudden you start seeing the small parts yourself uh, on how to hit a tennis ball and you become more proficient at it. Did that help you um, it, writing this book? Yeah, actually we, we created the content eight, nine years ago. So we've been using it uh, around, uh, companies have been using it around the globe and we certify people on this process even. And so we've just perfected it in the certification process. That's probably what helped the most. Uh, writing it, just it was actually pretty easy to write because we've been living it for so long. So how young should people be taught communication skills? Uh, you know, at what age are they actually receptive to learning about this and utilizing it? My son and I have a company called Six Summers, and it's basically helping parents equip their kids from 13 to 18. If you can do it pre-13, please do. The earlier, the better. And what we've figured out is if you can create content that a 13 year old can understand, you can scale anything. And um, so that's what we, we would recommend as, as easy, as early as possible. And what we've done is we've, we've created visual, uh, common language and a visual tool. And so by doing that, you can actually teach it to younger students and younger um, kids. Um, and then it becomes common language and it becomes objective language, not subjective. The problem with most communication is it's subjective. You know what, Mark? You always, you never, and that level of you always, you never, that provokes pride, anger, frustration. Oh, yeah? Well, you've never. <laughs> and that's when the missiles come out, right? But right? creating Absolutely. objective common language is the key to relational trust. It's the key to your high performance. It's the key to peace inside relationship. I, we hear companies all the time telling us in Vietnam how they want our students to develop their soft skills. And I, I, I know they call this a soft skill. That's really a hard skill to develop, right? It's the hardest skill. People are the people are so difficult. When we were starting my first businesses, we were we we figured out the business in a in a very easy way to think of it, it's strategy, it's capital, it's people. Do you have the right business model? Do you have the right financial model? And then do you have the people to make that happen? Well, the people are usually the ones that screw everything up. They screw the strategic business plan up, they screw up the business model, the financial model. And so to actually get people to get aligned, to communicate, to build trust with one another, to get strategically aligned and to execute together, it's so difficult because of the complexities of where people are, because we're all affected by other people. So someone else in our life affects us positively or negatively, which then affects our contribution in a team or in an organization. Um, you write about five simple cipher code words. What are they and how did you come up with them? So we used the idea of the Enigma code uh, in World War II and the Germans, you know, the breaking the code. Uh, once you broke the code, we could understand what their secret um, missions were. And so what we did, I'm just, I'll put it up here. I'll post and show you what they are. So for those um, who are watching, the five communication codes are critique, collaborate, clarify, care, and celebrate. And what, we, what we figured out was these are the core words or what people are basically asking for or wanting. So if I'm with you, Mark, um, I'm, I'm going, okay, yeah, Mark, we're having a conversation. What is it you need from me right now? Do you need me to celebrate? Do you need care from me? Do you want me to clarify? Do you want collaboration or do you want critique? And typically um, what will happen is someone will offer something that the other person didn't want. So back to objectivity, if you understand the code words and you understand, hey, hey, Mark, 
Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you. I want to first celebrate. And then I know you're going to ask some questions. So I want you to clarify. And, and maybe we can collaborate at that point. But I really want to celebrate because I've worked really hard on this. Well, now I've just given you the code words of what it is I'm looking for. So you'll have an easier time to connect with me. But let's say uh, if I'm talking to someone and their main default communication style was critique and I need care. So every time I meet with you, you critique. I don't want critique. I don't need critique. I need care. But because I don't get it from you, I start putting a wall up and I pull back from you and I never communicate with you. I never tell you why there's a disconnect. And then you have no idea and you go, wow, they're always in a bad mood. No, actually, you're always critiquing and they want something different. And so it's really important to understand what is it the other person is wanting. And that happened to you and your partner as you talk about exactly what you just said in, in the book. How, how did you resolve that uh, with you and your partner? Because what you described in there um, could easily break up the partnership. I mean, after a <laughs> while, you get tired of, I mean, he was he was uh, trying to do be positive in his own way, but it was always coming out negative. Yeah, well, uh, one, we were joking, you know, he's British, so that's a, a kind of, it was a joke. But the, yeah. the British, uh, you know, they're, they have a little bit of a cynicism, typically. Right. Uh, so what I what I said, though, is like, hey, I'm so excited. I just got back. Uh, we we closed the deal. I was giving him communi uh, celebration language. Like, I want to celebrate. This is so cool. As I go through the deal points, he starts to furrow his brow and start going, but why did you do that? We didn't talk about this. We were, I thought we were said we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And the deal was actually better than we had talked about, but it wasn't how we talked about it. I was like, well, it's called ingenuity. We had to work around a few things, but those are minor points, not majors. And then all of a sudden, I had a my, my memory of past communications come up and going, you're critiquing again. This happens a lot. And then I hulked. I blew up. And I'm like, why can't you just celebrate? Why can't this be? Why is everything a fight? Why can't you know, blah, blah, blah. And we're community, we're, we're frustrated, but it was pent up in me. It was all of the past critiques that were all coming. And it was just one of those things where we sat down and we built the communication code in that restaurant. We didn't leave until we created those five C's that I just laid out. So we had enough responsiveness to simmer down. And go, okay, wait, what is it that you were, what is it you wanted, Jeremy? I wanted you to celebrate and at best clarify first. But I tend to always get critique and here's how it comes across. He's unaware that he does that or did that. Well, other people in his life were hinting at that to him as well. So it, what it was, was an opportunity for Steve to go, wow, maybe I bring critique when I think I'm bringing clarity or collaboration, but it sounds like critique. Interesting. So he had a learning opportunity. Now I had a learning opportunity to go, Hey, I need to put Kevlar on. I need to, I need to toughen up a little bit. Everything can't be celebration all the time. So we both realized through the language, what it is that we want. And his celebration looks different than my celebration. All celebration is not equal. All care is not equal. All so we started to go, let's customize our code from one another. What is it exactly that you're looking for? What is it exactly? And now we use the code words. We did it yesterday. We had a meeting. He goes, hey, um, I go, hey, I want your collaboration, but I really need you to clarify first. I don't need you to celebrate. I know you care for me. Please clarify. He did. He asked some great questions. I go, exactly. Good job, man. And he goes, ta-da, it works. And it was great. We had a great conversation and we moved on. Uh, in the introduction, you write, your science is creating visual tools that make a common language that creates objectivity, not subjectivity, which you've been alluding to here. Please explain why this is important. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's every, uh, when, when you can give a visual, it's like, well, let me put it this way. A common objective tool is like a mirror. And when I put a mirror out in front of you, so let me get, let me give you an example. Instead of talking about it, I'm going to show you um, an example of this. 
when I give you a mirror and say, hey, what's it like to be on the other side of you? Um, so uh, here's an expectation scale. Now I'm creating common language and a visual. So I go, hey, Mark, sometimes when we're meeting, I feel like your expectations of me are impossible. And so you're asking for things that are just impossible from where we're at in reality. And maybe at best it's unrealistic, but what that's doing is I'm putting up a wall and now we're using common language in a visual form. By doing common language in a visual form, now we can communicate. In the same way that I'd use the five communication codes, that's a visual tool. It's meant to be a mirror. So uh, I'll give you an example for all of you listening or watching. If you can see these, this tool, the communication codes, if I ask you a question like a mirror, uh, let's think about you. If you are married or have a partner, um, what is it like to be on the other side of you? So now here's where the objectivity comes in. Um, what is the mirror? But when you're looking in a mirror, what is your tendency to that person? What's your default? Do you critique first? Do you collaborate? Do you clarify? Do you care? Do you celebrate? Now, I, if I ask the other question, what do they want first? Oh my gosh, my wife wants me to care and I tend to critique. Huh, yeah, that happens all the time. Right, what, what do you want and what does she tend to do? I want to celebrate and she tends to collaborate when I don't want her to collaborate. Okay, so now we have common objective language and a visual tool and now that allows us to communicate way more effectively. I hear kids uh, in college say often that the parents keep pushing, 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 like nothing is um, good enough. And the parents thinking that we're just maximizing the potential, you're a parent, I'm a parent, when actually you're uh, driving a stake into the heart of the relationship, right? That's how, it. Pa how can parents be better at wanting to maximize their kids' potential, but at the same time be encouraging and, and essentially not discouraging by basically telling me even if they win the trophy, oh, you won the trophy, but you could have been better than what you even did. What I do, and I did this recently with my kids, I've also done this within a team meeting um, as, as uh, early as this morning. <laughs> I did it with my team. Um, we start with celebrate. Here's what I would, I would recommend. If you're a parent to your kids, start with celebrate first. When you have a conversation, hey, what do we want to celebrate in the last week? Hey, good job on cleaning your room. Like that was exactly how to do it. Thank you. Or great job on the blah, blah, blah. I noticed. Or sport event, grades, whatever. Celebrate. Care is just being aware of your, your kids. Like what do they need right now? Where are they? They're going through finals. It's stressful. Hey, um, do you need anything? I'm, I want to help you um, with such and such. Clarify next. Um, okay, I just want to clarify. Did you do you, do you are you aware that we need to have this done by X date? Are we on the same page? Collaborate. Can I help you with anything? By the time you get through that, you don't even need to critique. It, it, critique won't even need to happen because you've you've done it in clarify or collaborate. And if you do that with kids, um, they'll respond really well because you're celebrating, you're caring. Clarify and collaborate is where challenge can come. You can challenge them. But if all they experience is critique, they will close. They'll raise their wall of self-preservation. And they and this happens with any person or so that self-preservation will come up and people are asking the question, your kids are asking, are you for me? Are you for yourself? Or are you against me? It feels like you're against me. And when they feel like you're against me, self-preservation goes up and then they go find other people. They go find other places to get affirmed. Yeah, I, uh, I see that all, all the time. And that's why some coaches burn themselves out uh, with players is, yeah, they're, the constant critique, eventually you wear yourself out and nobody wants to hear that anymore. Um, Mark, please talk another, about how, I'm sorry. Uh, Another example of that real fast, especially yep. in coaching, because we work in sports a lot. Uh, we use the term, uh, it's the sport challenge matrix, high support and high challenge. They have to go together. Sometimes the child or uh, a person needs more challenge. Sometimes they need more support. So it's situational, right? So that 
Tight support means I'm going to give you everything you need to do to roll a job. Challenge is I'm going to hold you accountable to the goals you've set. So to liberate someone, you're consistently collabor- uh, uh, calibrating high support with high challenge. And that's a key component that I think is really, really important for parents or, you know, for, for business leaders. Uh, please talk about how people misuse the golden rule and explain how Dr. Tony Alessandra's platinum rule. Yeah, so the golden rule is, um, you know, do unto others as you want done to yourself. So what happens then people take that, I, we've seen, well, I don't need a hug. Why do you need a hug? Um, I don't, I don't, I didn't get training. Why do you need training? Figure it out. And so the idea is that no, actually the golden rule, the platinum rule is do unto others as they would want done is actually the golden rule. So the platinum rule, do unto others as they would want done. So there, therefore you're thinking now, how did they want me to communicate? What is it they're trying to communicate right now? And by doing that, you're now thinking more about the other person than you are yourself. So the chances of you connecting, communicating are going to go up dramatically. Um, how is it that we have never uh, been more connected, but feel more isolated? You write this yeah. in the book. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, you think about the amount of social media, all the things that have been written about. We, we have every communication tool imaginable, but it's, it's actually a distribute. It's communication distribution. No one's being taught how. It's like, yeah, you could use social media. Yeah, you could use email. Yeah, you can use text. You can use all of these mediums. But if you don't know how to be at peace with people, if you don't know how to communicate, then you'll do more damage. So now you're getting a DM. Have you ever got a text message from someone and you read it as if they're screaming and they're not even thinking that way at all? Well, what happens is people don't know how to communicate. They, they know how to use platforms to communicate, but what they're doing is they're transmitting. Transmission is not communication. Transmitting is I'm just sending data over a medium to someone else. So it's, it's the power of the medium that's really important. Is this a, um, you know, if we face-to-face is always the best because you can read body language, you can read tone and tact, you can feel the energy of the other person. But once you remove all of that, uh, and so that's what's happened. We just have mediums now and people are inept because they haven't taken the time to figure out what's it like to be on the other side of themselves. I can't even tell you how many times people, you send emails and people uh, in a um, somewhat stressful situation and how misinterpreted uh, emails get, the written word, that just doesn't convey it right. Hence why you always have to talk to people, whether it's through in-person or Zoom, right? Um, Because all those things are kind of lost. And you say, that's not what I meant. That's not what I was trying to say. But that's all they, that's what they read, right? That's right. You gave a great example of two people being frustrated when one thought they were communicating well and the other didn't and left the company. How do you get someone to see they're being successful and adjust their communication? So it, it kind of boils down to um, levels of influence and trust. So if, if I'm communicating to someone, I always ask the question, do you know I'm for you or do you think I'm against you or do you think I'm for myself? And if they understand my intent and my intent is for them, then the next thing I have to think of is, is this person historically responsive? or resistant. Responsive is they're secure, they're confident, they're humble, they'll take information, they'll get better. Resistant is insecure, they're arrogant, they're full of pride, and oh yeah, well, you're showing my weakness, who do you think you are? And so the resistance uh, usually never ends well. So in communication for us, we're simply always going, okay, one, do they know your intent? Are you truly showing that you're for them? If you are, are they responsive or resistant? If they're resistant and you're for them, um, then you give them a chance to be responsive. Well, how, I don't know how many chances, two, three, four, five, whatever. Um, and if they're not family, you can't fire family. Uh, but if they're not responsive, then they're not meant to be on the team because they're going to produce 
uh, all types of drama uh, long term. So it's just a way of of setting your own um, intent to people. Are you trustworthy? Do they know you're for them? If so, they'll listen. They'll adjust. Well, in Asia, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the businesses are family businesses. Uh, and in the United States, it's I think it's over 50 percent. Mm-hmm. So how do you you just said, hey, you can't fire family. <laughs> uh, how do you deal with that? How do you um, develop communication? Because that's always a problem. Uh, and how many stories have you heard where uh, father, son, you know, daughters, everybody stop talking and then the relationship is dead and it can't even be resurrected. Well, what, right. what's your advice here to head that mm-hmm. off before it actually happens? In the book, we actually, it, let's say it has happened. We have a, a, we have a negative power test. And in the book, we have people take it and go, okay, first, what's it like to be on the other side of you? Are you aware? And most dads uh, aren't. I'm a dad, you know, it's, so yeah. uh, it's like, so the, it, what has your history been like? Have you been someone who brought um, uh, no support and all challenge, meaning you dominated your kids or you abdicate and you pull away from your kid. So if that's what they've experienced from you, then what has to happen is they have to experience months of consistent support with the challenge. So that means you're going to have to show up and go, you know what, son, I'm so sorry. I realized I've been really hard on you. I want the best for you, but, but you, if you haven't felt it, I'm, I may not be making progress. So I'm going to do a good job of trying to bring support with the challenge. And then you have to show up and be consistent day in, day out for them to see that this is the new norm versus, oh, there's dad. He's going to go back to his old self again. And I think most dads kind of take family for granted, to be honest. And well, you're just part of the family. That's what you do. That's what my dad did for me. And that's back to the golden rule. I didn't get, uh, I didn't have a loving dad. You should be lucky. And in today's right. world, um, it's like now you love means you fight for the highest possible good of others. You bring support with challenge, but you have to bring support first, because if you haven't brought support first and only challenge, then they're they're not going to trust that you're for them. And that's a key component. Well, and especially with young people today who are more highly sensitive than our generation about things that would roll off our back, don't roll off the back. Yep, right. And for companies, now the because of Zoom and people are working globally, that if you're in Philadelphia and you don't like your boss, you can get a new boss in Houston. Uh, and so you don't have to put up with that. What are you telling the managers you're coaching now about how they should deal with uh, people under the age of 30? Well, so the the joke, you know, always is, um, you know, millennials, right? Oh, millennials. So the way that we describe it, uh, we say, um, in fact, if I use props here, I got a plant right here. So people are plants. So plants need water, sunlight, right? And soil, they need the right. And they usually have a card in it. So we created a certification called the five voices. The five voices certification tells you the plant card of every employee. So you can literally understand what kind of plant you have. This one needs more water. This one's a cactus. It needs less water. What most people do is they take a plant and they put it right underneath the desk for six months. They bring it up for review and it's all withered. And they're like plants these days. Wow. Millennials. And we're like, no, no, no. Whose responsibility is it for this plant to grow? Well, the plant wants to grow. You want it to grow. So we're mutually beneficially wanting to grow if you've hired a normal, average, good employee. There's a desire to grow. Okay, I need to help it grow. So I want to position it for growth. What happens, though, is most managers, most um, uh, bosses, they're so busy uh, in maybe they, they've just gotten worn out themselves. So they're, they're not they don't know how to develop and apprentice people because they've never experienced it themselves. They're not being taught that their whole thing is hit a quota, hit a number. 
But over time, if you don't develop your people and you deplete them and you don't build your atmosphere and your culture of your greenhouse of your people, then if you have a toxic culture, you got a turnover factory. And then it just, it just becomes miserable for everybody. Um, how do you ensure the visuals? And this is a question from the audience. How do you, uh, how do people ensure the visuals are in front of them or easily accessible as a tool? So in the books, we have uh, all of our visuals in our books, but we also, we have systems for that. So we certify people on our toolkit and we train managers. Uh, we train uh, uh, team leaders to think like the Sherpa on Mount Everest. Uh, your job is not to carry people up the mountain. Your job is to lead them up the mountain. So you got to bring support and challenge. So we use that that narrative of the Sherpa on Mount Everest as the best example of leadership. They have to perform while performing. They have to climb while helping people climb. That's what leadership is. So um, therefore, we basically give them the toolkit through their certifications, through the giant content, um, and then they learn the tool. And when they learn the visual tool, they'll never forget it. We, we created tools that you can create on a cocktail napkin. Because the secret of 21st century learning is when you teach it to someone else, you learn. So if you can teach, and you know that, Mark, as a teacher yourself, yep. is when you when they can teach it to someone else, they learn it more effectively. So that's ultimately the science behind the tools. And we just we provide them in our certification, we provide them in our books. Many people in a personal relationship often fail because one is a screamer or they didn't com communicate their frustration and blow up and walk away. How do you begin to fix that? Uh, ideally, you go deeper and you start understanding identity and personality and wiring. So we created the five voices, which is a simpler version of the big five of Carl Jung's work. We made it simple enough to go, hey, is my wife, is she a, a guardian, a nurturer, a connector? Is she a, is she a creative or a pioneer? There's five different uh, uh, categories. And those are the five voices. So if I know who she is or know who they are, then I know what the tendencies are of that voice. Or if I've been around someone forever and ever like a business partner, I know his tendencies are to do X, Y, and Z in stress behavior. So then, you know, the, def the definition of insanity, doing the same things over and over, expecting different results. So here you go, you got your business partner and he's on a tirade again. Your normal response is to blow it off, roll your eyes, walk out the room. How's that working for you? Is it solving it? Is it changing it? So what we like to do is just go, look, try something new, learn, how to use a different default. Learn how to use the tool. Do they need critique right now? Do they need to collaborate? Do they need clarity? Do they need care? Do they need to celebrate? Once you understand the expectation, then all of a sudden you can have, you can unlock that relationship. But here's what you do, ask them, hey Mark, before we get into it, are you wanting me to celebrate right now? It sounds like it. Or are you wanting more collaboration? No, 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 no. I, I want you just to care. I just need to vent. Oh, okay, cool. Now I'm just, I'm listening. It's active listening. But but I've given you a chance to tell me the code word so I can actually now meet your expectations. Uh, and hence, I told you when we got onto this about how it took me about 20 years to learn that. And yeah, tell, tell the illustration. Yeah. Well, um, the illustration was with somebody that I was dating. And so um, she was complaining about, you know, let me know about something bad that happened during her day. And I said to her, is this something I'm just supposed to listen to? Or are you looking for me to comment on it? And she was like so happy that she said, thank God you asked that question because I really just want you to listen. I don't really need you to come and save me. That's it. And so that is an example of care right here, creating a safe space to care. You, she didn't want your collaboration. She just wanted care. So great. So you did the appropriate communication code. So by doing that, your influence goes up. 
uh, your trust goes up. Now you've created a safe space for true collaboration in the future uh, versus if you always go, well, you know what, what you should have done, what I would have done is I would have just walked out. I would have told them what I thought. I, and she's like, that's not helpful. That's not a, I don't need you to tell me. And yet that's what happens. That's how so many adults lose influence with so many people because they're completely unaware of their default tendencies to communicate the wrong thing at the wrong time. Yeah, I have a very close friend that I have to tell him before I tell him the story that I'm not looking for him to give me feedback, just listen to the story. That's it, that's it. That's the communication code, you're doing it. I, I, I think also that people who are managers or leaders automatically start to do that, right? I mean, it's just in their DNA that they're used to having to uh, hear something and come up with a solution for it. So when they don't want, when people don't want that, they're not prepared for it. So that sound like a fair assumption? Yep, totally. Um, we have a question from the audience. It feels like it's trending that people are fearful of asking questions to start an exchange like this because they will lose ownership of the airtime. Do you feel people are overly verbose without a clear headline nowadays? Uh, it's talking longer. Yeah. So like, it's a good question. Uh, it depends on the relationship and the depth of the relationship uh, with me and my wife. It, it's, it's a different, and I think what happens if people, if you've done a good job of being consistent with people, and communicating effectively. Like I, I will say people think uh, I'm a good communicator. So because I practice at it and I'm thinking about you, okay, Mark, what is it you're trying to do? I'm trying to figure out ahead of time, but if you want me just to care or celebrate or clarify in order to collaborate and I do that well, then you're going to let me have more influence in your life. But if they don't sense that, then they don't want you to talk because you're like, oh, you're going to take over. And it, it might be a sign of not having as much influence as you should. But I found that if you are uh, bring wisdom, you bring peace, you bring clarity, you bring uh, value, then, then people will want it uh, if there's someone who's wise. The problem is we have a lot of What's the opposite of wise? <laughs> Foolish people in the world. But uh, how how important is it to be authentic when you do it? Because you've seen managers who will read a book like yours and and not be authentic. You know, they'll tell somebody, oh my God, you did this so well. But when they just don't even really believe what they're right. telling them, uh, all they want to do is follow this formula that you and yeah. other people who have similar books. Yeah, the way that we teach it is you actually do it with your team. So then you go, hey, guys, I learned this really, really cool tool. And it's just the communication code. And it, here's the five words. And, you know, uh, here's what my default is. I know I have a tendency to critique. And I'm so sorry. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm going to do a better job of asking you, uh, what about you? And so if you do it that way, now all of a sudden people see that you're working to get better and then it's just it's a tool uh tools can be misused uh and that will always happen people can take anything out of context but for the most part what we found over the last eight or nine years of doing this is it becomes part of the common objective language and we get stories every day from people who have a transformed marriage my son's talking to me again uh, oh my gosh, our team, it's so much easier. The drama has gone away because we've now got, you know, those kind of stories uh, pile in every single day. And we have about, we have about uh, 900 consultants in our world, around the world that um, are giants using this. And so the amount of stories I get, is kind of fun every single day. That sounds like an en either an endless number of books or it sounds like a TV show. That's truly, we've, we've, we've had that before. A lot of people have said that. Um, some people like to fight. It's in their communication style, but it can create uh, uh, voids that destroy. 
what do you tell each side if they want to make it work? Yeah, so um, the idea is, is your default to critique. And then I go, again, how's that working for you? Um, and are you responsive or resistant? Um, I have a person in my life that is um, never open to any feedback whatsoever, but loves to give it to other people. So guess how much influence that person has in my life? Not very much. Right. And, and so um, that person, uh, so I have a chance, I've had a chance to kind of go, hey, can we talk? Do you want to know what it's like to be on the other side of you? And they don't. And so therefore I kind of have to go, okay, I've done, I've, I've tried my best. Wish you the best. And, and yet at the other times, sometimes I've had people who I'm like, and this has happened with me personally. Hey dude, why is everything a battle? I'm for mm -hmm. you. Do you not know I'm for you? And their comments like, well, I'm just really passionate. And it probably comes out as I'm fighting. I'm like, well, let's work on it. You don't have to use that tone. You don't have to fight. This isn't a fight. And so it, it depends on the level of trust. Trust and influence will change people. No question. Uh, what's the best way to deal with people who keep things bottled up, which you mentioned in your couple's example? Um, the, yeah, so this happens a lot. Um, in the same way, it's different. In the same way, it's uh, learning to communicate. Well, if they're bottled up, the question is, is it because of your negative behavior that they've experienced from you? Meaning they feel like you're you're against them or for yourself. So they put a wall up and they, they're bottled up. Or is it a situation that they have because of a past hurt and wound? So what you have to do is you have to learn how to care. And you have to let consistency, you have to let love, which is fighting for the highest possible good in them, to care consistently for a period of time to see if you can't make incremental approaches. And sometimes that means they have to go to counseling. Sometimes that means uh, you're not the one to help them. It might be someone else, but it's all about consistency, Mark. I mean, like a consistent leader is unbelievably effective. A consistent husband or wife or parent can make a lot of change. Yeah. I mean, how many times have you heard people say, I don't know what this person's going to be like when they walk in? Yeah, that's it. And make it a more difficult. Well, I had some, a guest on here who worked uh, for Bill Gates for 14 years. And I was surprised to hear that. Uh, he said, you never knew what mood he was going to come in uh, to Microsoft. And he said it made it very challenging uh, to tell him if there was a problem uh, because you had to see, could he handle the problem that day? Just don't think Bill Gates would be like that. But th uh, that's the case. Mm -hmm. And so he said, you know, the, he, he, he's brilliant and clearly the product has been a huge term run. But in terms of growing the business and attracting really smart people who want to come to Microsoft and stay and make a career there, it made it much more challenging. Absolutely. Um, just... Please talk about three historical changes that must be addressed that affects communication and relational uh, development and its importance. Yeah, it's the same uh, premise. Uh, number one, uh, what have you experienced from me historically? Uh, do you know I'm for you? Do you think I'm against you? Do you feel like I've been up and down, right? Am I consistent and consistent? That's number one. Uh, number two has, how do I show up? Am I, am I dominating you? Am I abdicating to you? Have I been protecting you? Or am I liberating? Liberation is high support and high challenge. Liberation is not kumbaya. That's protecting. That's enabling. Um, li liberation is high, high support and high, high, high challenge. So how have I historically showed up to you? Um, that is really the historical. And then the last one is, is there anything I can do to show you that I'm for you? And in a lot of cases, it's like, it's too far gone. No. Nope. We've, I've gone, you know, and, and that happens with people as well. But what I found is if you think this way, it's like the negative power test. If I can do a review of me, if I can understand what my tendencies have been, and then if I can show you that I really want to get better with 
practical discipline consistency, then you can unlock a relationship. Um, you write about having positive and negative bosses. How do you work with a negative boss if you love the job? Yeah, yeah. So difficult. And I mean, I've had them in the past. I mean, we all have had a mix probably. Um, it, what it is for me is um, I wrote a book called The Peace Index. And the idea of The Peace Index is how do you have internal peace when there's no external peace? So it's called resilience, right? So the resilience of you, how do you be at peace when your entire world is not? You have to do a lot more work. So you have to make sure that your team is set. You have to make sure your communication is clear, but you can use the communication code and you can practice it when you're meeting with them. Hey, I'm just, um, I'm just curious. Do you want uh, me? You want collaboration? Do you want critique? You know, by asking the questions themselves, uh, you can use the communication code and it actually might give you a better way to know what they're thinking. So if, if that's the case with you, try it. Uh, asking them specifically if you want not celebrate or care if they're negative, but specifically ask them if they want collaboration or critique, and that can go a long way. Um, please talk about liberation and how to create that at work, uh, partner relationships and with your children. So think about the idea that leaders define culture, sub leaders define subculture. Culture is atmosphere. Um, culture is like a greenhouse. And inside a greenhouse are all of these plants, kids, employees, other people. So for me to go, okay, I've got a team. Uh, I'm the leader. I define the culture. Am I defining, is the culture a liberating one or a dominating one? Um, so liberation is, again, high support and high challenge. Uh, what do they need right now? I've got a, I've got a team member um, and they're, we're going through a transition because of a business change and that person doesn't have as many support staff. And so how do I bring support based on his personality and how do I keep the challenge without it becoming over challenging and under supporting? So I'm learning how to help him uh, not lose his leaves in this transition. And, but I'm being aware of it. I understand where we're at. I understand who he is. And so now I've got him on my radar that he needs a little bit more support right now. That's liberation. It's a liberation mindset. I want to fight for his highest possible good. I want to get him to the next level amidst this harder season for his division. Uh, you gave an example of what I think is a horrible leader. Uh, the micromanager who is rude, doesn't value other people's opinions, is demeaning. Why didn't the company fire him, but instead put him in another division so those people could suffer? It didn't make sense to me, but we yeah. see this happen quite it often. All the time, uh, primarily because they uh, are invaluable to the revenue line. Um, so I had a situation happen in Eugene, Oregon. I'm with this company and I made a test. I call it the, the 100, the Sherpa assessment. And the Sherpa assessment is, uh, so imagine a Sherpa on the mountain at Mount Everest. And I go, hey, one through 10, how is their climbing skills? And like their climbing skills, they're a nine out of 10, amazing climber. Great. How is the Sherpa, how are his leadership skills? to the other six climbers he's responsible. Uh, he's a one. He's horrible. No one likes to be with him. He doesn't communicate, doesn't look in the eyes. He just climbs. So he's a nine one. Okay, how, so what happens to those other six people? They die on the mountain or they leave. And so, uh, but well, why don't you get another Sherpa? But he can get to the top. He can make it. He's a, such a good, like, okay, he's not a leader. He's a performer. What happens in most cases is that we take high performers and we put them in supervisor roles because we're afraid of losing the revenue to that performer, but I can't pay him more money, but the manager role, actually the supervisor role earns more. So let me slide him over to that salary line. And yeah, I mean, we'll figure it out. Well, there people are miserable. Uh, because they're working for this performer. So what I always say is like, move them over as a performer. I would rather have a six uh, instead of a nine and a climber 
and an eight as a leader. I'd take a six, eight instead of a nine, one any day. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. I would have let him go in a heartbeat. But I know if he's putting up numbers, because that's what they're going to say. Yeah, he micromanage and they might hate it, but his numbers are always good. Uh, so we got to keep them. But I kind of feel like you should look at it like he died in a plane crash. What would I do? Find somebody, find That's somebody right. else. That's right. uh, what's the difference between realistic expectations and trying to push people to go higher and further than they felt possible? Because Steve Jobs and Elon Musk are noted for this and they've had great success. I had a uh, a chairman of a private equity group that I worked with. And I, I was one of the uh, acquisition guys. We bought 17 companies in three years and rolled them all together in this roll up. And I lost my hair during that process. <laughs> and I'll never forget, I was on the phone and he didn't, David didn't know I was on there. And he was talking to another analyst that, on another division. And he goes, uh, these schmucks and the schmucks he was talking about with me and two of my other colleagues. Because these schmucks have no idea. I'd take half of what they're going after. And I go, and and we felt it was impossible. They're like, guys, I need you. We're going to buy 21 companies in three years. If you've ever bought companies and you know that, how hard that is. And so he was forcing us to take bad deals or take companies that were suspect and it eventually hurt and harmed the, the overall, uh, the holding company. But uh, I go, hey David, we're, I'm on the phone. He goes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about, I'm talking about somebody else. I'm like, oh, other schmucks, huh? And so the reality is, Mark, that he uh, uh, he he had impossible expectations, and he's using that uh, to know that hey, if we do half of that, we're good. And I do think that's what probably Elon Musk and I know Steve Jobs definitely did, and that was a philosophy of theirs. Um, it can produce, it will produce a different culture. Sometimes the product's so good that, uh, in such a wow that it just works and it's a turnover factory and you're okay with it. Most of the time they're not Steve jobs, Apple or Elon Musk companies. These are manufacturing businesses and they become just again, turnover factories, miserable for everyone. Um, people use emotional manipulation all the time in personal relationships. How do you combat that without destroying the relationship? Um, you know, I, I think it's just the idea of uh, if you use the communication code, you're going to become more relationally intelligent. And that's ultimately what we're after. We're after people. We want people to know their individual insights it's called self-awareness. Are you aware of what's like to be on the other side of yourself? Know yourself to lead yourself. Once you know your tendencies and your patterns, you can go, oh my gosh, I need a behavior change. I can actually change, which then affects the dynamics with other people. Most people are just completely unaware. So they use whatever they can use, emotional manipulation, anything to sway other people. And that inauthenticity actually leads to less trust. So um, it's just a process. It's a, it's a journey that, that is a relational intelligence journey. Uh, what if knowing a person for a long time, you don't believe they have the capacity to change or want to, especially family members or an old friend? What do you, uh, what do, you do so you won't feel frustrated? Uh, you lower your expectations. <laughs> you, <laughs> you actually put a wall and go, you know what? Uh, I we have this. I have a family member, and it's like um, after thirty something years, um, I'm like, I'm gonna keep being consistently kind. I'm gonna show grace, but I'm also not going to expect. I'm not gonna expect the worst per se, but I'm not believing the best. So I have a tendency to go. I've got to. I've got to lower my expectations so that it doesn't control me. Uh, question from the audience: What's the difference? Uh, what's the difference maker between someone who buys in and and rocks this approach versus turkeys who never give it a, a try? Uh, it, it's called. Uh, there's a uh, there's a famous bell curve that talks about la laggards, and the, that a percentage of laggards. There's there's a lot of people who will never do this any of this because they think it's stupid. 
the but however uh when they experience it uh, and i have we have so much data of people who, who would write in and go you know when we first started doing giant or five voices or this kind of communication code i thought it was a bunch of hooey and then i noticed it worked with my kids and then i noticed it worked so it's actually um the experience of it, it this isn't just a it's not just a hack where you just use words. It's actually a process. And when people experience it, you're going to get a late majority. You'll have the early adopters, early majority. You'll have a late majority. And then there'll always be people who want the, the turkeys in that regard. But what I've found is, is that if you'll give it a shot, I mean, you think about it. I'm giving you common sense. It, how's it working now? If you give it a shot, and people experience it, then they might try doing it. And then all of a sudden you'll, you'll sweep the majority, the, the, the grand majority and the laggards will be about 20% that will never buy in. And 80% is always better. Uh, the other statistics I like is 13.7% of a group of people, oh no, sorry, 12.7% of a group of people can change the entire group. And that's a Columbia study. And uh, you know, Columbia University, I had this study. And so you think if you get a small majority who actually use tools, start changing culture, it can sw uh, sway the entire group. Um, please talk about relationship plaque and, and what it takes to fix it. Yeah, relationship plaque is over time, uh, you, you have a heart attack because of all just historical misabuse of your body. It's the same with relational plaque. It's like, um, your uh, daughter is it only experiences you one way all the time. Uh, it, to fix it, it's almost the same as a heart attack. You have a heart attack and it shapes people like, oh my gosh, I got to eat different. I got to work out. I got to do all the things that people told me to do, but I never did. What happens with a rela relational plaque, it leads to heartbreak because you have people in your life come to you and go, I'm done. I'm giving up on you. I'm leaving you. I'm... And it's like, what? Wait, no, I can change. And it just means that you have to do the hard stuff. Forgiveness, apology, looking in the mirror. I really am like this. And it's spiritual, it's emotional, it's mental, it's relational, and you don't want to get there. So the communication code gives you tools where you can actually do pre-work. It's like eating healthy. Learn the tools you hopefully won't get to the heartbreak of relational plaque or a heart attack. Um, I think we talked about this before we started the show here. If you're fr frustrated by someone, is it better to write it out, what is bothering you, or meet in person and talk about it? It depends on the other person. I would always say face-to-face -face is better, but it's like oh, the history of the other person. Is that person responsive or resistant? If they're always resistant, then you can write it out to practice. But I, I would probably say, I would never send an email or write it out. I would always go face to face. But sometimes it helps you to write it down first and then read it and think about it. But um, I've written a letter before. I've actually written a letter and then read a letter to someone. Uh, I've only done that once um, and it worked. Um, so. So here's my last question. How is AI affecting people's communication with other people? Because I think people are starting to use AI to formulate the responses for them. Mm -hmm. And and then there's uh, people unhappy on the other end receiving it. So what's your take on AI and and how could it, how could you use it in a positive way? Yeah, well, so we are, and it's kind of interesting. So if you want to check out the Five Voices app on the app store, uh, the Five Voices actually you take an assess assessment, you have someone else take an assessment and we have relational dynamics where it will show the differences between you two. And really, really, and so, sorry. Um, and so it's a really fascinating process where we've taken AI and used it for the most good possible. Um, so I've recognized anything can be used for good and evil. Uh, and in our case, we're going after the good. Well, I have to say it was a very quick uh, hour here. And I so thoroughly enjoyed your book and I endorse the, um, the people of all ages, but especially young people should read this. It could, and it will take away a lot of bad baggage and make your life a lot easier.
when you can learn these kinds of things. And I'm sure it has for you yeah. and your partner. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Good to be with you. Uh, great to be with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week as well. Everybody have a great weekend. Bye-bye.